Now, I'm excited and, and grateful for our speaker this morning. I, I love Chris Lazo, and uh, he's just easy to love. And uh, a lot of you know him from, uh, from Reality, where he's been the teaching pastor for this last season. Uh, before that, he led worship uh, uh, at Reality, and uh, he's just a, a humble and gifted man, uh, married to Brianna, father to Abigail, and uh, started off as a photographer at Brooks, and now look at him. So, Chris, we're just glad you're here. God be with you. We're eager to hear what he's given you. And come on up. Let me say a prayer for you. Yeah. Yeah. And Father, may the words of Chris's mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you. Amen. Thanks, Ben. Well, if you have uh, your Bibles with you, uh, I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 26, verse 20 through 25. We'll pray over the word, and then we'll get started. You can keep your thumb in that page. I'll be referring to it in about 10 minutes. Matthew 26, verse 20 through 25. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Bless you. Jesus asks his disciples to prepare the Passover, and it says in verse 20, by the gospel writer Matthew, when evening came, he was reclining at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I assure you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed, each one began to say to him, surely not, not I, Lord. He replied, the one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl. He will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, his betrayer, replied, Surely not I, Rabbi. You have said it, he told him. This is God's word. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to ask this morning, as we gather around your word, that you would speak to us through your word. I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would cause me to make much of Jesus Christ in this place. If there be one thing that we leave this, this gymnasium, this gathering with, that it would be a greater more beautiful, more alluring, more panoramic view of Jesus Christ. So make yourself big in this place, Lord. Make me exceedingly small. Make us small and brag about yourself in this place. Boast about your glory and your beauty and your splendor. We want to worship you. So we ask that you would do that by the presence and the power and the helping of your Holy Spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, it is a, a profound mystery to me that I'm standing here, of all places. For ever since I, I moved to Santa Barbara many years ago, I have found that I've not been able to get very far from Westmont students in one way or another. Before that makes any sense to you, you've got to know a couple of things about me. I, I moved here from Santa Cruz County, from a Christian upbringing and a Christian home, and I left that environment to largely find myself, as we often put it, uh, by going to college in the American Riviera and finding myself through a variety of means. And I found many things about myself that were not very good. In a matter of two years, all those, those layers inside of me of unhindered rebellion began to surface in me, and I began to ruin my life in a short matter of time upon being here and cut away from my church family, from the people that held me accountable, from even my Christian friends and those who loved me dearly, I found myself going down that, that spiral that so many other college students had told me about upon reaching Santa Barbara. And it was in the midst of that that the Westmont freshman began to pray for me. Her name, I'm just going to call her Amy, not her real name, but she, she moved here to go to Westmont from a youth group that we were both a part of in Santa Cruz County. 
she immediately began attending this church in Carpinteria, and as the church was uh, remodeling some of the walls in the building, they uh, started a prayer meeting by which they began to hand intercessors in the church these Sharpie markers, and they instructed them to write down the names of people whom they wanted to reach for Christ. And Amy took a Sharpie marker, and she wrote down my name and began to pray for my soul. Apparently, her prayers were answered, although I think she might have prayed a little too hard because now I work at her church. <laughs> Sometime after that, I, I ran into a, another Westmont student. His name was Rory. Rory was known around my church as the evangelist, because he was. He exuded more passion than I'd, I've ever known from a guy that young in my entire life. He was the type of guy that could convert you in the middle of aisle three of Trader Joe's while shopping, and he tried to do the same to me, even though I was a Christian already. I think I was about 27 years old and an intern at my local church when he saw me and apparently thought I was a, an 18-year-old punk with a drug problem or something. I probably acted like half of those things at the time, but he took me to a place, uh, I think it was a, a fat burger when it used to exist on State Street, bought me a burger, and I thought this was my moment to, to pour into this young man's life. I didn't get a chance. He pulled his Bible out of his backpack, slapped it on the table, picked up his burger, and began to take me verse by verse through First Peter, stopping every couple verses to make sure that I got it. There was a fire in his eyes. I had never seen that much passion in a person about Jesus Christ, my own age, in my entire life. Shortly after that, I met a Westmont alumni. Uh, his name was Dale. He opened his home group and his, his home to me and began to pray for me in one of the worst seasons of my life. Shortly after that, I met another alum from Westmont uh, by the name of Amber. Amber and her husband, Matt, took me on a journey to a third world country to break me of my consumeristic, individualistic tendencies. It was the first time I had ever been out of the country, not to mention outside of my own personal little bubble. Looking back, I guess in retrospect, it seems that God, for whatever reason, seemed to like using Westmont students to change my heart. God also used, liked to use Westmont students to break my heart. From the same youth group that Amy came from was another young man who was a fiery proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We used to have talks about scripture all the time and you could see the fire light in his eyes as well. I don't know what happened to him when he got here to Santa Barbara, but something clicked. I don't know whether it was doubt or skepticism or difficulties or trials, but he completely changed. He began to doubt the word of the Lord, and he began to doubt many things about Jesus himself. And when I met him for the first time at the D.C. and listened to him, I was trying to hold back tears. As a result of that, I got a few young college students together, and we began to meet on Friday nights, inviting any college student that we could find to worship the Lord and open up the scriptures that we would be drawn closer to Christ and not farther away from him. We used to call this gathering a dorn. It all started because of one Westmont student. In our first year as a college gathering, we decided to go on a, a lake trip to Lake Nas. We would do much of the same stuff, but on our little mountaintop experience. But the week before we got there, Rory was there. He had been invited by a youth group to speak to about 40 or 50, I think it was, uh, high school students, and he did, just like he did to me at Fat Burger with that fire in his eyes. He proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he jumped into the lake and never emerged. One week later, that would take about 70 college students, most of them Westmont. We would go to that same lake with a sense of heaviness and sobriety, Partly in, in, due to the fact that we had lost a dear friend, but also due to the fact that there seemed to be in that place where he was a heaviness, a fragrance, if you will, of Christ. And the same thing that, that happened to me and to people that I had grown up with happened there at that lake. Some people were dramatically impacted by it for the glory of God and others were indifferent 
And there I was baffled by the whole thing. And now looking at the text in front of us, I see a similar pattern emerge. A group of people walking with Jesus day in and day out for three years. Eleven of them coming to the conclusion that he is in fact Lord, except for one who distances himself from Jesus by calling him rabbi. Indeed, he just got back from betraying Jesus himself. And after looking at all of these vignettes and my own personal experience and even what the Gospels declare, I find myself wondering about the human experience questions, you know? Like, how in the world can people going to the same Christian church, to the same Christian college, with the same Christian friends, at the same Christian youth group, reading the same Christian Bible, knowing the same Christian doctrines, come away from the same Christian environment with a radically different experience of the same Jesus? According to Matthew's depiction of Judas... It sounds like you can walk with Jesus for three years and still not know who he is. And I find that a little difficult to swallow at times because the truth be told, if I were there on the scene with Judas, I wouldn't fault him for anything. He was doing all the right things. He was doing the things that I would have been doing. He's doing the things that some of us would be doing. Couldn't we relate with some of the things that Jesus, he was passionate, he was feeding the poor, he was busy doing ministry, he was handling the finances of the best nonprofit in existence. He was doing it, man. And yet after the miracles and after the teachings and after, this is what baffles my mind, after the personal relationship with Jesus Christ himself, he walks away, distancing himself from Jesus, calling him rabbi and not Lord. At some point in time, did Judas wake up and realize that all the good things that he was busy doing in ministry and in service were not for Christ so much as they were to make much of himself? And then I discovered that self-righteous is a subtle, very wicked thing. And if that truly is the problem, well, then I am much more like Judas than I care to admit. I've taken some of the good things that I've done in life, my ambitions, my passions, my good works, my actions, and I have equated them with the gospel, meaning the good news of Jesus Christ is what I'm able to offer him. And in doing so, I have twisted the gospel to be not so much good news about Jesus, but good news about me. And over the years, I've, I've seen some of, some of you do the same thing. Probably with the best intentions in your heart, but saying, what is Christianity all about? Well, it's, 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 it's about being as passionate as possible. If I could just be more passionate, if I could just be as passionate as this person, well, it's about working up my faith. I just gotta have faith. No, I gotta have a hunger and a thirst for God. No, I gotta be a better Westmont student. No, I gotta be a better Christian. No, I've gotta surrender my all. No, I gotta transform culture. No, I've gotta be more like the early church was. They had it together. No, I've got to figure out the latest debate with Calvinism and Arminianism. No, I've gotta solve uh, the latest problem in, in the global sphere. Some of you, just like me, and others before me, have turned the gospel into news primarily about you and what you've done, and you wonder why you hit those moments where your faith is shipwrecked, when the things that you are doing fall through. The gospel, my friends, is not seen in the disciples' actions towards Christ, but in Christ's actions towards the disciples. We're on this scene, even prior, Jesus knowing and seeing Judas in the act of betraying him. We're told in John chapter 13 that he dons a slave's apron, kneels down, and washes their feet. Not just Peter, not just Andrew, not just any of those guys. He sits down and he washes Judas' feet. 
prefiguring the moment when he would stretch out his arms and pour out his life on a cross, not just to cleanse hardened hearts like Judas, but ours. To take the brunt of our sin, to take the brunt of the wrath that we deserved as we sang about this morning. And not just for the wrong things that we have done, but for the right things that we have done for the wrong reasons, to make much of ourselves. The modern mindset often thinks of the cross as a barbaric thought. How in the world would we ever serve or worship a God who would do something like that? And maybe it is a little barbaric. Until you have a kid. As Ben shared, I I have a six and a half month old daughter named Abigail, which means the father's joy, because she is. I don't know if we have a picture of her. Do we have a picture? (laughs) That face will get me to do anything that she will ever want. I would do anything to get her to smile and react to me the way that she is doing right there. And when those moments come where she's not smiling, but she is weeping uncontrollably, it's usually for something like teething or a cold or something as mundane as the tag of her shirt scratching her in the wrong direction but things that are out of her control, that are driving her nuts, that are possibly the worst thing that she's ever gone through in the experience of her own life. And how and why would I, not as a father, take some of those off of her shoulders? And yet I've heard stories from fathers experiencing much worse things than, than that. You could, you could take that off if you want. Or you could leave it on there all week. That's good too. I don't mind. My pastor, Britt Merrick, recently lost his daughter, Daisy Love, to a a three-and-a-half-year bout with cancer, once told me in a personal conversation, if I could, I would take her cancer into my own body. I would rather go through all of that stuff than my daughter go through it. And I think most fathers would say the same thing. I know after six-and-a-half months into it, I'd say the same thing. And yet, how much of us are helpless and cannot do such a thing? You know what Paul said in Romans? He said, that which we were unable to do by the weakness of our flesh, God did by sending his son. Meaning that the gospel is not so much about how much you love God and have proved so with your life. The gospel is about how much God loves you and has proven so with his. And there comes a radical shift in a person's mind when we start to think of it in that way. It's in the historic truth of the gospel that chains begin to break. It's when I stop fixating on myself and how good I am and how I'm going to bless the Lord and how I'm going to better the world when I start to start, uh, when I start from a place of seeing what Christ has done for me first, that my chains begin to break. And that's the story of the last 10 years of my life. And there was often a Westmont alumni in the periphery of that trajectory. So I guess I'm here to say thank you for that. Even though most of you weren't here. And I want to return the favor by asking you the same question. I want to ask you, do you know Jesus Christ? Don't play Christian college with me. I know you know a lot of things about Jesus Christ. You have some of the best professors on earth. I know you might even have preconceived ideas about him. I know you might have theories about him. I know you might have accurate thoughts about him. I'm not even asking that. I'm asking, do you know who he is? I know you've done a lot for Jesus Christ. 
Some of you have battled human trafficking. Some of you have sat in the trenches with the warriors of social justice. You've fed the hungry and thirsty. You've sheltered the poor. You've argued in semantic detail all the nuances of theology. You've rose to the top of corporations and industries all over the country, even all over the world, representing Westmont and even the name of Jesus Christ. But I'm not asking that either. I'm asking, do you know Jesus Christ whom you represent? And I know many of you are here for most of those reasons. To get a bachelor's degree, to make much of your life, to do something worthwhile, to have fun, to meet somebody special, whatever. And those are all fine and commendable, but that's not the question I'm asking. And perhaps God will upset your equilibrium while you're here by revealing himself to you in the gospel. Tim Keller put the gospel this way. You're not loved because you're valuable. You're valuable because you're loved. And some of you are still at this point flirting around with less than that hoping that in the remaining years at your stay at Westmont, you can make much of your life, thereby justifying your reason for existence. Although I hate to say it, in doing so, we are a little more like Judas than we would like to admit. But here's the good news. Same God who washed the feet of his own betrayer kneels down to wash yours too. If that's what you believe in, if that's even what you want to believe in but have a hard time doing so, ask God that his Holy Spirit might reveal Jesus Christ to you in a way that you might know and be revealed and enjoy and as the Apostle Peter would say, with inexpressible joy full of glory. I've often been shaken by the thought of the gospel that it is one of the most outlandish things that we've ever been told. Yet one of the easiest things to get a hold of since it is made available to everybody within earshot by faith. Pray that you get a taste of that. Heavenly Father, thank you for where you have us today in a perfect environment. The ways in which you've already revealed yourself, the things that you have already done and the fact that we get to be a part of those things in such a place as this and yet because of the Garden of Eden we know that a perfect environment does not a changed life make. Therefore, we ask for the glory of God in the face of Christ to be put on full display by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you've already been doing that long before I got here. We just want to ask simply as little children, more, Lord. You would pour yourself out and reveal yourself in such a way that we would never be the same again, and we would be counted among those who do not call you rabbi, but fall on their knees and say, my Lord and my God. You once issued a promise to the Hebrews that if they were to seek after you, they would find you if they sought after you with their whole heart. I know that was to them, but I pray that that would be true of Westmont and myself too. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I love you guys. May the Holy Spirit minister to you apart from anything that I said that it was not his will and may you go out this morning in the peace of Christ Jesus, amen.